Okay, so this is a quickie, and I apologise <laughs> straight off the bat for the dodgy moustache, um, but it's for the Mo Movember uh, charity thing. So I wanted to respond to a guy called Craig Reed, who I think is a Christian apologist. I, I watched your video on the way home, Craig, uh, entitled, I'll tell you exactly what it was entitled. Very unprofessional of me looking something up like this. Um, it was entitled, What are the Atheist Wars? What is a lack of belief atheist? And I wanted to make a few comments on that because let me say that there is a part of an aspect to your video that I agreed with, which is that I think there are some atheists who rely too much on hiding behind a, a lack of belief. I do believe that there are some uh, contexts Maybe at odds with Steve McRae here. But there are some contexts whereupon, definitionally, that is a useful definition. I think in terms of some surveys, or if we were to discuss potential uncontacted tribes or life forms that had no conceptualization of God, but nevertheless the capacity to conceive of a God, that that would be reasonable to regard them as an atheist. Um, for example. Uh, but I think that there are many other circumstances where that is a, an unsatisfactory uh, definition. And particularly with regards to anybody who takes part in a discussion. I think if you are taking part in a discussion involving the sort of great debate, does God exist, blah, 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 then it, it is spectacularly unlikely that you do not possess toxastic attitudes towards propositions pertaining to God. I believe God exists. I think there's a high probability God exists, a low probability a God exists. Um, I don't believe that God exists, etc., etc. So, yeah, the chance that you wouldn't hold such beliefs uh, seems somewhat extraordinary. And so, to some extent, I, I buy that. It's not a useful, it's not a sensible thing to rely, well, it might be, it might be a sensible thing to rely upon in terms of avoiding having to provide some positive answers of your own, but I don't think it's a very satisfying intellectual position. Um, but I, I disagreed fundamentally with the way that you set your video out, and I want to explain why. First off, I disagreed, I suppose, on a personal level. I objected to the part that you, where you said that Crocoduck is the only person who has made arguments. I think there's a number of us who've made arguments. I've made arguments uh, in the past, a number of them. I can think a couple off the top of my head. Of course, it all depends upon how you categorise God, doesn't it? Um, because if you take a sort of very broad brush approach... How how do you formulate an argument that covers everything? You can't, can you? Um, but if you're talking about particular conceptualizations, I've I've made a video arguing that I think omnibenevolence and omnipotence are logically incompatible. Um, that that effectively omnipotence, sorry, omnibenevolence um, renders you in some ways impotent in ways that I'm not. You're on rails in, in many circumstances rather than being able to do any logically possible action there's only one action that you can perform. I am more potent than God if God is omnibenevolent. God can only do the maximally benevolent thing in any circumstance whereas I can do a whole array of things, thousands of things in the same set of circumstances. It's a strange definition of omnipotence. Of course, there's always counter-arguments, I get that. One of the counter-arguments to that is, um, I'm, I'm getting, this is a little bit of an aside, but one of the counter-arguments to that is, well, God can do, God is omnipotent because he can do anything that is logically consistent with his nature. And then I heard a great counter to that, which pr 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 proposed a God called something like McNothing or something like that. And that is a God who his very nature is, he can do absolutely nothing, right? Um, ergo, that God would be omnipotent 
because he can do everything which is within his nature, which is absolutely nothing. Obviously, that is an absurdity. To be omnipotent, you, as well as being able to do everything within your nature, surely you have to do everything that it's logically possible to be able to do um, for any agent, right? Otherwise, you're not omnipotent. But that would be an example of a video to suggest that omnipotence and omnibenevolence are logically un incompatible. I made one about, oh, God, it'd be about nine years ago now, called I Know You Haven't Got Soul, where I argued that from lots and lots of different ways that, that the idea that we have an immaterial, immortal soul that survives our death is just simply not true. And I attempted to demonstrate that in a variety of ways. And that has major ramifications, of course, for omnibenevolence, I propose. It's very difficult substantiate the, the claim that God is omnibenevolent if this is all we have. There are babies born without any fucking skin, right? There are babies born in absolute agony who lead short, agonising existences and then die. Um, if a God is omnipotent and could do something about that, it's hard to tie that in with omnibenevolence. Uh, unless you can propose some kind of afterlife, some kind of means to make reparations for the terrible tragedies that occur here on earth, if there's no part of us that survives, no immaterial immortal part that survives our mortal death, then there's no mechanism by which you can achieve that. So there's another argument. You might not like the arguments, you might not buy the arguments, but I've made those arguments and, and, and a number of others. Um, but that wasn't really why I wanted to respond. Why I wanted to respond is because I felt as if the point you'd made had a kind of gaping hole in it. Which is that effective, effectively you juxtapose these two things as a kind of dichotomy. Whereupon on the one hand you have atheists who adopt this sort of lack of belief position. Don't substantiate anything, don't want to make any positive claims or arguments. And then on the other hand, you had these other atheists which consisted just of crocoduck, but how you proposed all atheists involved in this discussion should sort of comport themselves, which is this idea that you should try and prove that God does not exist. And I think that shows a fundamental misunderstanding or a misrepresentation perhaps we often talk about the burden of proof but the burden of proof is very rarely really about proof in a sort of deductive sense it's a legal term of course and, and in the legal sense proof always falls short of or almost always falls short of deductive proof you have different standards of evidence of course in a civil case there isn't usually a burden of proof the evidential burden is evenly shared on both parties and it goes with a balance of evidence, a preponderance of evidence. There's certainly a burden of proof in a criminal case, but that is to prove something beyond all reasonable doubt. It's not absolute certitude. It's not the sort of nailed on deductive proof that you're talking about. It's an evidential burden. And... Even in philosophy, generally that is often the case. Sometimes we're talking about axiomatic, deductive proof. This is what we're starting with. Given this, this and this, then this. But that's not always the case in philosophy. We're often not talking about that, even when we're discussing things in philosophical terms. And I think that is the case here. We're talking about people's beliefs and what is rational to believe and disbelieve. And... Proof really doesn't enter into it. We don't wait until we have absolute certitude before we believe something, do we? If I thought there was an 80% chance that God existed, believe in God. If I thought there was an 80% God, chance God didn't exist, I'd subscribe to. I, I don't believe in God. Well, that's not quite true because I don't formulate my beliefs like that. I tend to think of it, I would say there's a high probability God exists, so I believe there's a low probability that God exists. I prefer not to shoehorn them into sort of uh, propositional statements that are absolutes that don't quite fit what I actually believe, which is what people tend to expect people to do. 
don't think it works very well that but um i hope you get my point that's that's just not how it works so whilst i agree with you that i think it behooves atheists to make if you're interested in the debate not just atheists functionally right you don't have a god belief um but anybody who's considered it which almost everybody has, let's be honest. And certainly every single atheist who takes part in these discussions has considered it, usually at some considerable length. And so I think it behooves you to actually make some arguments of your own, sub substantiate your positions, to substantiate your claims. And people are making claims. Um, but it's not about proving things. And so... To adopt this position where, well, look, if you try, the reason atheists adopt, which is what you say in your video, the reason atheists adopt this lack of belief position is because as soon as they try and prove God doesn't exist, they're going to get owned, they're going to get destroyed. Well, in many ways they will, because if you stand there as an atheist and say, I can prove that god doesn't exist you're going to get about as fucking far as if you say i can prove that unicorns don't exist which of course you can't do you can scour the fucking earth for unicorns right but you're never going to prove that unicorns don't exist but what you can do is you can adopt you can look at these questions from a sort of balance of probabilities and uh sort of uh, uh, and, and it, it describe them in that way and that is really the middle ground right that we ought to be discussing and, and fighting over in some cases so yeah i think it, it, it's great when atheists make positive arguments towards specific uh conceptualizations of deities and towards broader conceptualizations of deities you can never cover them all <laughs> um, but i think it is worth making those arguments but let's get away from this demand well okay you've got to prove that god doesn't exist or what or, or what if you don't prove it doesn't exist what you just you're just going to believe in anything that hasn't been absolutely disproven of course you're not of course you're not going to do that are you you're going to look at what are the arguments in this direction and what are the arguments in that direction and you're going to weigh those little fuckers up aren't you and you're going to say well does it tip this way or does it tip that way and that's really what is at stake here that's what you ought to be arguing for and i propose the reason that this is important is that once you start arguing for that your claim then that atheists are just going to get destroyed melts away it's true if an atheist is so bold as to say yes i can stand here and utterly disprove any logical possibility of a deity existing of course but why would you do that why would you do that with pretty much anything right you wouldn't would you you wouldn't do that um what you would show is that something really is a pretty incredulous proposition or that it's unlikely or it seems less likely than the alternative that you're offering. Okay, that's it. A bit waffly, I know, but I just wanted to listen to it on the way home. Just wanted to respond.